Welcome to Fort Zachary Taylor State Park here in the beautiful Florida Keys in the southernmost point of the continental United States. My name's Rick. Most of you know me as Dead Eye Rick, and I'd like to welcome you to my favorite place on earth, Fort Zachary Taylor. Construction of Fort Zachary Taylor began in 1844 as part of the third system of seacoast fortifications. This was a network of 46 fortresses that were built along the eastern seaboard of the United States. A couple of them were on the Gulf Coast and a few out on the Pacific Coast, but for the most part, they were concentrated protecting the harbors along the uh, eastern seaboard. In fact, when the guys got sat down together with the U.S. War Department and decided on where to put their fortresses, uh, they decided on these spots almost seemingly randomly by going, okay, we need it here, 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 and here. And of course, there was a little bit more thought attached to it. Uh, apparently, it would take about a day's journey to go from one fortress to the next to help keep them supplied and so forth. But there were a couple of uh, elements about these fortresses that were the same, and there were also a lot of elements that were different. Uh, a lot of them that I visited are single-story structures, but several are much, much taller. Uh, Fort Zachary Taylor uh, today is only one story, but it uh, used to be a uh, full three tiers worth of guns, uh, two actual casemented uh, floors and a rooftop that was also well on. Over time, as technology changed, the tall fortress wasn't necessary, and they actually dynamited off the top and changed it for an adaptation to the new and changing technology. Right around 1898, Fort Zachary Taylor changed completely. So what they realized in later years was that such a tall fortress was too easy a target to hit. Uh, shipboard cannons and artillery had changed in such a way that they could shoot farther and uh, they could hit a taller target much easier. So they blew off the top of Fort Zachary Taylor. Uh, those more accurate guns also had more penetrating power and they needed thicker walls here and the original walls just wouldn't cut it. So they took all of the debris from the blasting off at the top of the fortress and threw it all into the old gun rooms in order to thicken up those original walls. So now they had super, super thick exterior walls. And then they went ahead and built brand new bunkers behind it to house the newer technologies uh, for like the Spanish-American War, World War I, and on into World War II. Now when they did this, uh, they filled in the old gun rooms, not just with the bricks and rocks and other debris from the top floors, but they threw the equipment in there as well. And if you look here into the wall next to me, you'll see that some of the old cannons are still sticking out of the masonry. Uh, these cannons, of course, will never be removed because they serve as sort of a rebar, strengthening and supporting up the fortress and keeping it from falling. Uh, also, as you can see from up here on the roof, are the iron plates put over all of the old holes that were put into the roof when Howard England was doing his excavation on Fort Zachary Taylor. Our artifact collection came from underneath those plates. Right now those are in storage and they can't come back to us until we have a proper way of displaying them. During the U.S. Civil War, Fort Zachary Taylor served the purpose of protecting Key West Harbor. Key West Harbor was the headquarters of the Union Blockade Squadron against the South. This headquarters never did get attacked throughout the course of the war. It really should have been. The South should have tried. But because of this fortress, they didn't even think about it. The whole idea behind building Fort Zachary Taylor was to have a, an overkill concept of firepower and fortress. It was huge. Uh, not only was it big and right next to the, uh, the harbor, but it featured gigantic cannons. And we had a good array of them mounted here in the fortress, and they are the reason why we didn't get attacked. So this gun right here is the Model 1844 8-inch Columbia. Back in the day, this was the state-of-the-art gun, and uh, it was the first gun that they actually installed here at Fort Zachary Taylor. The problem with this gun is that it had a tendency to blow up out the breech, and the reason for this is during rapid fire, the iron on the inside would heat up and soften and allow it to weaken and crack. So to combat this, uh, the engineers at the foundry came up with certain ways that they can uh, improve the design to combat these weaknesses. One of them, the most obvious, is a breech reinforcement where they added additional iron here to the back of the gun to keep it from blowing up out the back end. Also, the stress points were critical, like here at the trunnion. When the iron gets soft and the cannon goes back on its recoil, all of the pressure and all of the stress is right here on these, and that causes it to crack across the middle. And if you look close, you can see that there's a bit of uh, additional iron right here in the midpoint of the gun. Also, out here at the barrel, at the very end of the muzzle, uh, you have it where it flares out, and they pack on additional iron here, plus a reinforcing band right here to keep it from doing the banana peel thing right out the front end. Cannons actually did this, and it was a puzzle that the engineers and the foundries had to solve. 
So this is another example of the Model 1844 uh, heavy iron seacoast gun, also known as the Columbiad. Now, the Columbiad grew slowly over time, as it was invented in uh, 1811 by George Bomford. Uh, and the early Columbiads weren't referred to as Columbiads yet. Uh, they were simply referred to as the uh, cast iron siege gun and uh, they slowly got larger, but over time, the term Columbiad uh, began to be adopted to uh, describe all of the uh, large seacoast cannons. Uh, however, George Bomford's guns are the ones that we commonly refer to directly by the Columbiad name. Now, the reason they didn't just start making them this size in the first place is because they had to conduct all kinds of calculations and such to determine how long to rest the gun in between shots to keep it from heating up and exploding how thick did the sidewalls have to be, how thick did the reinforcements have to be, and so on. And these calculations, it wasn't enough to just leave them on paper. They had to make trial tests and go out and proof these guns. Can you imagine taking one of these brand new giant guns out into the field, packing it up with powder, firing it, and hoping for the best, uncertain whether or not it's gonna explode? Catastrophic testing, it had to be fun. In 1861, a guy named Thomas Jackson Rondon approached the U.S. War Department with some brand new ideas concerning improvements about the seacoast artillery. And this gun right here, the Model 1861 10-inch Rodman, was the innovation that he came up with. If you'll notice, there are no visible reinforcements to cause this gun to be stronger, yet it was much stronger and much better than the earlier Columbiads. What he did was knowing that uh, faster cooling iron had a tendency to be harder and more resilient and the slower cooling iron softer, he took the cooling jacket from the outside of the gun and put it down the barrel instead. In this way, the harder, more durable iron was now on the inside of the gun, thus enabling Mr. Rodman to make a much, much larger gun than they were previously capable of doing. So whereas the 10-inch variety of Rodman is where he began making his guns, uh, Columbiad kind of ended at the 10-inch variety. And of course, Mr. Rodman went on to make the 15-inch variety with a 300-pound cannonball and even the monstrous 20-inch cannon. So, at the same time that Mr. Rodman approached the War Department with his revolutionary ideas, a guy named Mr. Parrott also approached the War Department with his. Now, Mr. Parrott's concepts were very similar to Rodman's in the fact that in order to make a stronger gun, he did the cooling jacket all the way down the inside of the barrel, the water flush system, as it's called, and that created a, uh, a better gun, as we uh, have already covered. But Mr. Parrott went the extra distance, and he packed on this gigantic breech reinforcement to help prevent the uh, problem with exploding out the back end. Now, it's more complicated than just packing on a bunch of extra iron. For example, he did the mathematics and the formulas and all the calculations to figure out that whereas the cast iron that is the barrel of the gun, that's kind of brittle. Wrought iron is not as brittle. So he cast the gun standardly out of uh, cast iron and then put on a wrought iron breech reinforcement to prevent this gun from exploding. Now, in theory, this would have worked great, except for the fact that the uh, cannon crews would get overconfident in the firing of this gun. And whereas it was common practice to rest a gun in between shots to let that iron cool down a little bit, the gun crews neglected that on this particular piece. As a result, the parrot rifled cannon became the one notorious for blowing up all the time. Of all of the innovations brought to the table by Mr. Parrott, uh, the most impressive and the one that caused this to be the revolutionary piece of its time is found down the barrel. And if you look closely, you'll see spiral grooves. This is called rifling. A rifled cannon would not fire a round cannonball. A round cannonball would come flying out of the end of this gun and the rifling inside of it, those grooves, would cause it to spin in a spiral way and that would make an already inaccurate round ball even less accurate. So instead, they would fire a bullet-shaped projectile out of this one. That bullet-shaped projectile would actually spin like a football and fly farther and straighter, making this cannon the most accurate thing of its day. Now, the downside of that is that bullet-shaped projectile would actually penetrate deep inside of brick walls. And if you had an exploding charge, it would blow the fortress up from the inside out. So it was the parrot gun that was actually the death of fortresses and rendered them all obsolete. So the important function that Fort Zachary Taylor served during the U.S. Civil War was to protect Key West Harbor, which was the headquarters of the Union Blockade Squadron against the South. Our cannons, as before mentioned, uh, had really, really strong firepower. And in fact, our smallest gun could hit this island right here, Mule Key. Mule Key is about two and a half miles offshore and sits almost exactly on the opposite side of our main channel. So even our smallest gun could completely shut down the main approach to our harbor.
So after the Spanish-American War, after 1898, Fort Zachary Taylor continued to see active service through World War I and World War II, but after World War II it was decommissioned. Afterwards it was used as a Navy dump site, and during this period of time the fortress actually got buried. They were doing a massive program where they were deepening the channel on approach to Key West Harbor, and with all of the spoil or dirt that they pulled up from the seabed, they managed to extend the beach line from a quarter mile that side of Fort Taylor to a quarter mile that side of Fort Taylor. So now we're completely landlocked. And like I said, during this time, we got completely buried. In 1968, a guy named Howard England came here and he laid eyes on the fortress and it just brought him to tears. So he took it upon himself and a team of volunteers that he personally assembled to begin an excavation of Fort Zachary Taylor. And all of the work that uh, Howard England and the Sandhogs did back then, between 1968 and 1973, uh, is the reason why we have a fort and a park to this day. So when Howard England unburied Fort Zachary Taylor in uh, 1968, uh, he discovered the world's largest collection of Civil War era artifacts. Not all of it was Civil War stuff. There were things from later periods uh, buried here as well. And uh, a lot of those artifacts are right here at Fort Taylor. The lion's share of our collection is actually in storage because we don't have a museum to display uh, our artifacts in. And the ones that we do have, uh, well, there's no way to display those either. So the nature of our program here is, uh, first of all, yes, it's the restoration of the fortress. But my goal, in a shorter term, is to actually establish a museum here inside some of these wings that are actually safe for people to come inside of. In this way, I can take artifacts like this gun carriage here and, and these uh, uh, turrets right here and actually put them on display with a little bit of explanation, something for the people to actually glean from their visit here to the park. You know, the building is here, but the artifacts are also here and they need to be displayed. And uh, that, of course, is our purpose, to establish a museum and get these artifacts out for the public. So, the project that we've started here is a phase, a uh, multi-phased task, where the first phase is actually the closing up of these wings of the fortress so we can install a museum. Before we can display any of our artifacts of any kind, we have to be able to protect them from hurricanes, thieves, vandals, things like that. So that means doors and shutters. Shutters being the first phase, as you can see, I've got them underway right now. Uh, our organization has been uh, actively involved in this now for about, I don't know, six months, and we're about halfway done with the, uh, the shutter project. When the shutters are done, then we'll go on to doors. So, I'm sure you're thinking, what's so complicated about doing a little bit of masonry, some doors, and some shutters? No big deal. Any construction guy can do it, right? Well, that's not necessarily true. You see, a historic fortification like this one was built in a specific way and with specific materials. And if you don't use those same specific materials, you run the risk of damaging the fortress. So we have to be very careful here. For example, if you use the wrong mortar in your masonry, the bricks start to shatter. I've got evidence here all over the place where somebody repaired the fortress and they used the wrong mortar. You see, these bricks, they swell with moisture. And if the mortar doesn't uh, give a little bit when the bricks swell, they wind up shattering. So what somebody thought was actually fixing the fortress in the long run has damaged it even worse. That's something that we have to go back and repair now. Also, whenever someone is putting doors, windows, trim work of any kind, a lot of times they'll use like lag bolts or tap cons or they'll screw right into the building and in some cases I've found nails into the masonry. Well, when these bricks are absorbing moisture, they're also absorbing salts. And everywhere you look in the fortress where people have put iron fasteners into the brickwork, those iron fasteners have corroded in the salt, swollen, and caused the bricks to shatter around them. Now, when I'm putting in my shutters and my door jams and all these things that I'm trying to do or that we're trying to do here, uh, I can't be doing the same thing these other people have. I can't repeat those mistakes. So instead, I've taken a chapter out of ship's joinery and I've compressed my jams into place in such a way that even with the swelling and the shrinking and the warpage that wood is natural going to do, my compressions distribute the pressure uh, to the core and the interior of the building so that over time my shutters don't damage the cover face. In 10 years, I don't want the face of the building to fall off. We're fixing it, right? Given the history and current condition of Fort Zachary Taylor, it's really quite alarming to see it in the condition that it's in today. It really was important and critical back in its heyday, but today it really is falling apart and it saddens us to no end. This is why Friends of Fort Taylor has stepped up and has taken the initiative to begin the restoration project of our own volition. And so we've gotten together and begun the program. 
It's very ambitious, and progress is very, very slow. It really is a labor of love, but together, yeah, together we can make it happen. Well, now I do have good news to report. Through the collaborative efforts of Friends of Fort Taylor and the Florida State Park Service, we have managed to make tremendous progress on our program. Uh, for example, a number of years ago, Friends of Fort Taylor managed to get this roof installed on the old barracks wing where our museum is intended to be uh, installed at. Uh, by providing a waterproof protected environment, we can actually uh, shelter our artifacts and our displays effectively. A few years later, uh, the State Park Service stepped up and they installed these iron rails around the rooftops allowing safe access to park patrons. And now, during this period of uh, construction, we're installing our museum shutters and doors. So the laying of plans and doing the physical work, well, that's the easy part. But now comes the hard part, asking for help. You see, our program is entirely funded by private donations and volunteer efforts. So, in order to advance our program, please, we need your help. If you would like to be a part of our program here at Fort Zachary Taylor, then we, the Friends of Fort Taylor, encourage you to do so, and here's how. To become a member or to make a donation, you may contact us at foftkw.com. On behalf of the Florida State Park Service, Friends of Fort Taylor, and Dead Eyes Workshop, we thank you for your support.